Precision Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com, who offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths to match how you sweat. You can personalize your hydration strategy today at PrecisionHydration.com and get a free box or tube of pH worth up to $9.99 using the code OxygenAddict. We're also brought to you by FoodCell.co.uk, the next generation of top tube nutritional carriers for your bike. They're designed to allow endurance triathletes and cyclists to carry enough food and gels while allowing easy access. You can check it out at foodcell.co.uk. Finally, we're brought to you by teamoxygenatic.com triathlon coaching, helping hundreds of age group triathletes see huge improvements in the 70.3 and Ironman performances. The time training system will make sure you get the important training done each week in a way that complements the rest of your life. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. It's just me this week flying solo. I'm doing a quick pre-record of this one because um, I'm away this weekend, so we've not been able to find a slot where Hells and I can record together. So fear not, she's got a great interview in the bag, so you'll be hearing her dulcet tones a little bit later on in the show. This week, we've got a brilliant interview that she's done with British elite triathlete and training partner to the Brownleys, Mark Buckingham. Uh, Mark's now doing some coaching, so it's a fascinating insight into his life at the moment. He's a performance partner for British Triathlon, which means basically he gets paid to train with the Brownleys. He's a coach, he's a para guide ahead of the Paralympics, and he also runs wetsuit company Yonder. So loads of interesting stuff coming up there later on today. But first, before we jump into that interview, we've got a few bits and bobs to tell you. First up, from our sponsors, Food Cell. They have been really successful in the launch so far, and they've managed to reduce the price from now on that they're selling their food cells for. So the price has been reduced by £5 down to £39.99. Listeners to previous episodes of the show, the free post code that we used to use is no longer valid from now on. But the good news is it has been reduced in price down to £39.99. Now, they've got another competition running between... July the 16th and August the 7th, they've got a competition to win a free entry into the Outlaw X half iron distance race that's taking place on Sunday the 22nd of September at Thorsby Park in Nottinghamshire. It's going to be a brilliant end of season event that one. It looks like it's going to be a cracking race and if you buy a food sell between July the 16th until August the 7th, click to select the box and agree to the terms and conditions at checkout and you can win yourself uh, a free or going to the competition to win a free entry for that race as well as getting yourself a brilliant top tube nutritional carrier i've been going on about this for weeks i'm using mine at the moment on my tt bike to carry the spares kicks i've always struggled really badly to find a place i can get the spares on the bike when i've got a bottle behind the saddle so i can get a tube a couple of co2s tire levers and a multi-tool in there doesn't rattle super easy to get the stuff in and out of and it's just as useful for that as if you wanted to use it for its intended purpose which is carrying food and gels in it it's nice and big inside despite not looking big on the outside you can slide it open and shut with one finger and get up to four of those big fat gels or two massive chunks of flapjack in there to fuel your long distance triathlon so get over there to food cell and check it out Other news to talk you through, I've just got off Skype with Andy Blow from Precision Hydration and we've put together, it's a really great show I'm looking forward to hearing, Uh, for a few weeks time we're going to do a hydration special and this was led in large part by the fact that there's been so much crazy weather over Europe at the moment and we've been hearing so much in our Facebook groups about people really struggling on race day because it was so much hotter wherever they raced than it might have been in training. And obviously people's hydration and electrolyte needs change depending on the weather conditions. You need a lot more water and electrolytes if it's really hot. So we put an hour long special together. So keep an eye out for that one. Remember, you can get over to precisionhydration.com and take their online sweat test. This is really clever. Less than one minute Um, online survey that you take that will give you an idea of whether you're a high, medium or low volume sweater, that's how much sweat comes out, or high, medium or low sodium content sweater, which again is really super important. It's incredibly variable from person to person. I'm really excited to talk about all this stuff because long time listeners will know I really, really struggle when it's hot. I sweat somewhere in the region of 1600 milligrams of sodium, which is pretty well close to twice as much as the average person. So it's really, really hard for me to train or race well unless I'm making sure I take care of that. So 
if you're the same as me, if you feel really wobbly after training or you suffer with cramps, it's very likely that getting your electrolytes and your hydration and stuff sorted can be a big part of that. So get over precisionhydration.com, check it out. Loads of great articles on the blog to read as well that are super interesting. So educate yourself. This isn't just like an advertising slot. It's all about educating you so that you can have a better race and better training performances. All right, then. Last week on the show, I talked about how we were using our race performance race review document with athletes to help people go over the races that they've had after they've raced and to analyze the results in two ways. Firstly, to look for things you can do even better if you've had a brilliant race, but also to go over the things that you did on race day and the things you did in training leading up to race day if you didn't have the race that you wanted. So we're going to go through a little bit more of this race review document today because I really think it's going to help some people out. Last week, we talked through the general overview of the document. This week, we're going to go over a little bit about how we things we check out about the run up to the event and then things we analyze about the swim. So first up, we're going to look over. I think it's a good idea to sit and do this with a pen and a piece of paper. I mentioned this to you before in previous episodes. You can download this full document from the link in the show notes, print it out, use a pen and being forced to collect your thoughts on paper is actually a really good way to be forced to be honest with yourself. It's almost like using the paper as a reflective coach who's going to reflect back to you what you actually did. So print the document out and then go through this document as if there was someone sitting with you asking you these questions. So the first one says, how did your training go in the lead up to the event? So we want you to be honest here. Look over your diary or your Training Peaks account. Were you able to complete some or all or not very many of the sessions that were in Training Peaks? Were you able to meet your key performance targets? For example, hitting the power targets on the bike. What was your pace like relative to the prescribed pace on your run sessions? What was your swim duration and distance and volume like in the lead up to the event? And what were there any health issues, niggles, injuries, illnesses, just a time to sort of reflect over your training diary and really be really be clear about what's actually gone on. I did a couple of calls last week with athletes who took advantage of our like opportunity to have a review of their document with me. And both of them said like it was really interesting for them to go through this have someone reflect back to them honestly what's actually happening rather than what they thought was happening and the first part of that is being honest with yourself and writing down what did actually happen so in one case we had someone who when they looked back over the data they really hadn't done very much for taper they'd got like 17 18 hours in the week before the big week before an ironman and again i put a stack load of hours in actually in race week itself so come race day they just weren't tapered or fresh and that in itself is is a reflection on, well, they didn't do it because they didn't know they shouldn't taper. They did it because they were so excited about the race. They just kept going out to do more hours. And again, it's a really common thing with self-coached athletes. You're really excited to go and do stuff. You get out there to do stuff in the week before the race. But the end result is if you're not tapered down, you're not going to feel fresh. And if you are really fit on race day, you don't get a chance to show it because you're also really tired. So the aim of that taper is to reduce the amount of volume, You don't really lose any fitness over that short period of time, although your mind will tell you that you are doing. But what does happen is you feel super fresh and you're ready to really give it a go on race day. So it's all about not being fatigued to come race day. Now, the next part of this section is reviewing your race performance in the swim. We've got five criteria we'll look at here. The first one is what was your confidence level like in your swim fitness and ability going into the race? So the reason for doing this is It's not about how fit you are necessarily, but it's about your confidence level in your swim fitness. So you might be someone who's a beginner swimmer who's got really confident, in which case you're in a great position. It might be that you're someone who has been really swim fit in the past and doesn't feel very swim fit come race day because you perhaps haven't done as much training. So reflecting on that, reflecting on how you felt about yourself is the starting point of this. Second question is, what was your swim result relative to what your expectation was? So again, that's just hard fact here. What did you think you were going to do? What did you actually swim on race day? The next question says, were there any major contributing factors, positive or negative, to your swim performance? For example, 
the water conditions on race day was it really windy and wavy did you get cramp did you have bad drafting problems was it unexpectedly non-wetsuit sighting issues pacing issues gives you a chance to reflect over all of that and then at the end of this we'll be able to collect those ideas to show you what you can do differently next time the last the next to last point says how did you feel at the end of the swim so again ideally we want you coming out feeling really fresh and ready to go on the bike and if that wasn't the case we need to look for reasons why and then finally were there any other comments about your swim things that went well things to improve things to focus on before your next race it might be as simple as realizing that if you're swimming on a sunny day and the sun's rising and you've got goggles that aren't tinted that you need to get a pair of tinted goggles for next time but it's really important to collect those thoughts put them down on paper and then you've got a record for next time and when we get the all the way to the end of the sheet we're going to have a little section where we collect all the learnings from this so you've got something to reflect back on for next time now i mentioned last week and i'll do the same again this week Download this document, go through it yourself when you've had your race result, and then you get to honestly reflect on your result. And if you've not had the race that you feel you deserve or expected, and you're interested in finding out how training with Team Oxygen Addict methodology might help you unlock your performance for next time. Again, I've got a couple of slots available this week that you can come and talk through your results with me over Skype or phone or whatever suits you. There's a quick link in the show notes. Click the link, pop your email address on the form, and there's a couple of bits of information that will help me learn a little bit about the race that you've done. And I'll just email you uh, a, a link that lets you book a time on my calendar, basically. We'll jump onto Skype. I'll go through your training on Training Peaks with you. We'll have a look at your race day results and see if we can't find out the one or more reasons why you perhaps didn't have the race result that you wanted because with the calls we've done this week often it's been really interested both the guys i've done it with have said look it's really interesting just being forced to sit down with a piece of paper and do this and neither of them wanted to do it because obviously when things don't go the way you hope they do you don't really want to sit and and find the reasons why so if you are the kind of person who's going to look for answers for next time This is the first step. It's it's recognizing that it is hard to look for the reasons why things didn't go to plan. But you've invested all this time and energy in doing the training. You need to invest the time and energy to work out what didn't go well. And often it's, it's just good to have another set of eyes go over the data and say, you know, for example, looks like you you did a massive amount of volume in the two weeks before the race. Why was that? Just getting an athlete to reflect on that and go, yeah, do you know what? I probably knew at the time I shouldn't have been doing that, but I couldn't hold myself back from training. Another set of eyes over the power data to say, well, you might have felt all right on the bike, but the power data says that your intensity factor was much higher than it probably should have been in order for you to be able to run well. That allows you to separate out the thought of, well, I felt okay on the bike with someone with a bit of experience looking at the numbers and say, well, actually, if you'd perhaps dropped it down four or five percent in the overall intensity, you then would probably have had a better chance at a, a better overall run in the second half of the run, for example. So anyway, have a look at that. Um, download the document, fill it out. And if you want to jump onto Skype, click that link and send me your email address and I'll do whatever I can to get in touch with as many people as I've got time for. Um, and I'm just going to play out a couple of minutes here. We've got a testimonial from one of the Team Oxygen Addict members, Sean Trimble. Um, he's had some great races this year, so I wanted to play out his experience in the team and let you hear for yourself firsthand what his experience has been like. Hi, guys. My name is Sean Trimble. Um, I'm a member of Team Oxygen Addict and I'm doing this video just to tell you how Coach Rob and the team have really helped me to transform my triathlon training. Um, I am in my third year of triathlon. Uh, I started off um, basically doing some short races, some sprints, um, and then looked to join uh, Oxygen Addict and have been a member now for two years. Um, Without a doubt, the the training and the coaching has enabled me to really uh, improve an awful lot. Um, So for example, my uh, FTP has gone from around 150 when I first started uh, to upwards of uh, around 270 currently um, and also my 70.3 racing um, has really come down from last year where I um, managed a, a 6.15 um, to this year currently at a 5.38 so I've seen some real huge gains um, across the couple of years that I've been with the team. Um, Two main things really uh, enticed me to join the team. Uh, one was Rob's approach to time management. 
Um, I'm a head teacher, um, do long hours. Um, so the approach to training from managing time very carefully was absolutely essential for me. Um, and also I had to do something different um, because I was suffering an awful lot from uh, injuries around running um, uh, to the point where I was almost going to give up sort of almost all forms of running type activities. I guess the, the approach to running um, has particularly helped me because of those injuries. So running at e-pace and running a lot slower for the vast majority of the time just seems to work. Um, when you combine that with the approach to the cycling and doing, particularly during the winter months, some really hard, high intensity cycling um, and working with power, um, you do see that transfer of your cardiovascular fitness into your running. Um, and of course, the best thing about it is that your, your risk of injury is really, really low. Um, I think the way that the team is structured and the setup is absolutely fantastic. Uh, the community and support that you get within the team is, is absolutely awesome. It's brilliant. Um, uh, it's nice recently to come back from Nottingham 70.3 and see so many people running around in the kit and cheer each other on. But the online community is really, really important as well. I think if you've got a question, there's somebody out there who can answer it. So in summary, I, I love the team. I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's been brilliant for me. Um, I'm able to train very, very consistently. I'm injury free, which is fantastic. I love that, that I'm just injury free and I don't worry about going out running anymore. My overall triathlon times, they're just coming down and down. Um, and you know, being a, an older athlete, that's really, really nice to see. So I'm a big fan and it's a fantastic setup. Okay, so moving into the interview of the week this week, we have got our interview with Mark Buckingham. Mark Buckingham, welcome back to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. Last time you were on, it was still Cup of Try. That was 2015. I was looking back. What the heck has happened since? Wow, what has happened since? That's I know. Time. So yeah, four years. Yes. Uh, that's flown by, to be fair. It's mad, isn't um, it? So last time we were talking to you, you were still racing WTS. Yeah, I think I was just finishing up um, my WTS career, as it was. Um, I think I went to Worlds that year in Chicago. And I think that's the last time I did. That could be the last time I'd done an ITU race. I'm not sure. Um, I know I must have had a... I'd have to have two years off course. That's the new policy for to be a, a, a guide, for a para guide, is that you can't have raced ITU for, a, I think it's a couple of years, or maybe it's gone to a season now or something like that. So yeah. Wow. Let's start there then. Paraguiding. When did you first think, yeah, I could do that. I want to get into that. I got asked to do it. I think because again, going back to the point that I had done the IT race and that had made me eligible for it. And the kind of the looking for, they were looking for um, um, a guy at that point in time. This was two years ago to guide for Dave Ellis because his current guide um, at the time was Carl Shaw had crashed and broke his collarbone and so the new the btf always seemed to know my schedule and they knew, <laughs> they knew that they knew that i might be free at, uh for eton dawny british champs um uh, you know within i think i had two weeks notice or something and i said you know what i'll do it if you need someone i'll do it and if i'm eligible I could, yeah that's fine and i had all my medical stuff done as well because i think that's a big thing now you've got to be like medically cleared to do any kind of ITU racing, um, you know, whether it's on the non-drafting circuit, uh, WTS or para. Um, and, and so, yeah, I was like, yeah, I've never rode a tandem, but I'll give it a go. Um, and yeah, it, it worked out well. Um, and then they asked me to do a couple more races that year. And, um, yeah, we did them and we were crowned, um, world champions last year as well which was good um myself and dave so um even though i'd prefer to say he was crowned world champion yeah and, you and i'm and, and i'm just yeah i'm just helping like you know uh, the guides get medals and stuff and you lift the tape together and stuff like that but i still kind of feel it's it's got to be dave's moment not mine that's just how i am about it but um yeah let's say dave was world champion <laughs> the, the, the the guides used not to get medals. Yeah, yeah. Um, which have only I think have only brought that in in the last couple of years, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I, I I guess it's just to acknowledge that they play a, a part as well. Uh, which I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say I don't. But um, you know, we 
we kind of I wouldn't be there without Dave, whereas he could be there with another guide without me type thing. So I kind of yeah. I start, yeah, I, I, I guess it's good that they do that. And um, I think the thing I like about it is um, you're part of a team. And I've always kind of searched that, even though I've always done individual sport, um, you know, growing up as a runner and going to triathlon. Um, I've always craved that team element. Um, and so that was the pretty cool thing about this whole guiding journey. And you, you, like the partnership, it really hadn't been going for very long at all, had it, before you were sort of thrown in? Um, what with Dave's original? No, with you, like you, or, you or and him me, together, yeah. and then you made like really sort of really rapid progress ahead of you know ahead of the world championship win as well. Yeah, well, I, you know, a lot of credit to British Triathlon with that because right from where I go when I started triathlon at um, at the age of twenty five, I had to learn within you know two years of how to you know master the craft well not master it but get better i get, get a lot better at it um so that i could line up on a world series start line and um i think the same thing happened with the para guiding and you know british triathlon facilitated that they got me over to loughborough and uh, you know got me sat on the tandem and I, that's the only way i learn is if i try try something i mean you can show me a thousand videos of someone riding a tandem but i've kind of got to feel it and experience it first and then I think the other thing that made it a lot easier is is Dave himself. He's so easy to work with. Like he, well, he's me, he's he's mega laid back um, and easy going. But when you're kind of trying to learn new skills fast, you don't want you know someone breathing down your neck, I guess, and and maybe judging you too much that you're doing it wrong. And Dave just like lets you learn, and that, you know that's brilliant. And what's what is the the sort of the, the the pressure like as the guide because you don't want to mess up. No, um, you don't. And yeah, I think on the, I think it's only the bike that you can stuff up really. Like if you if you lay that down like I did this weekend, it's not great if if you take someone down with you. And um, I think I think I think other than that, I mean the the tandems are quite hard to um, to crash you know, by going around the corner too fast and sliding out there because you've got so much weight on the bike, it, it st- sticks to the floor quite well. Um, so other than like sighting properly in the swim, you know, I kind of thought, well, there's not too much that can go wrong. Um, you know, that that's not any different to how I would race normally. Um, and maybe you're just a little bit more cautious through technical bits. And um, I, th- I think the difficulty in para racing is that they have multiple um disciplines on the course at the same time yep. which makes it quite difficult you've got people joining the course like you know on their first lap as you're finishing your last lap and um they're in the race and you're in the race and um you know th- th- i think you've got to be more careful about that and just aware and and then communicate as much as you can i think that was the bit i maybe added um a bit to the the whole setup i said to dave surely it's better if i tell you when there's a corner coming because then you can like get ready to position your foot to lean on a certain side and he's you know that's something that he didn't really do before and um yeah i think i was just trying to find ways to upskill us both as a partnership as quick as possible it must have been a really interesting element to get into as well and to develop those skills just because it is so different isn't it to the itu or to 70.3 it's it's kind of a completely added element so how is it looking for tokyo paralympics at the moment because dave's category wasn't in the rio olympics was it so he was like nearing quitting and everything so dave as as the sort of current world champion he he should qualify quite comfortably um so i think he'll have got his first lot of ranking points at the weekend at montreal where he won with luke pollard so um i then think he's got to go to the test event and nail that one um and and then hopefully we'll um he, he's doing that with uh tim don in Tokyo, and then um, the grand final in Lausanne. I'm I'm doing that one with him again. So it's kind of Paris World Championships are at Lausanne. Um, so providing he podiums at, uh, at those next two races, Tokyo and Lausanne, he's I think he's pretty much in. So um, 
yeah, barring any mishaps, he should be good. Um, and then I think actually a lot of the British athletes that are current, that their disciplines in the games next year, they're all sitting pretty well um, in terms of actually going to be able to compete at the games, um, which is quite good. I think British para sports in a in a really good place in terms of triathlon. So. Um, yeah, everything everything should be good. So right now, Dave's got um, I'm one of three race guides that he's got. Um, so that's myself, Luke Pollard, and Tim Don. What is the thinking with mixing and matching and changing? Is it just testing it out, or is it? Yeah, I think it's just trying to find who's the best guy for Tokyo. Um, uh, so you know, there's the big uh, variable of the heat that everyone's talking about for Tokyo is going to be super hot. Um, so you've got to make sure that the guides, you know, properly equipped, uh, to racing in the heat. Um, but yeah, I think, um, there's obviously, you know, uh, paratrice funded like the Olympic program is, and they've got a pool of, of money that they can use in certain areas. And they kind of thought, well, Ga- the guide's pretty important in, pa- in terms of the team, so let's try and find the best one possible. Um, so I think it's a re- you know it's a really good thing that they're doing it. I think three three guides is probably um, a manageable number because Dave will do probably six or seven races this year, so it all gives it gives us then like two opportunities each to race with him. Yeah, and then from that they can use like you know power profiles and you know different time splits and uh how dave thought that we uh added to the environment and and things like that uh and then i think probably um yeah by early next year they'll kind of decide who they want um to travel with dave to tokyo yeah wow it's ace. So, so, it's what, cool, yeah. so what's happening with the the preparation then that the heat prep i saw Johnny Brownlee has do, been doing a lot of training in his conservatory with the heaters on. Um, yeah. I imagine in Loughborough as well, they're doing different stuff there. So, yeah, who who is, I guess, everyone's preparing in different ways or? Yeah, they are. Well, um, you know, talking about power, they've just been to um, Florida for a couple of weeks ahead of the Montreal race. So they used Florida and we kind of used Loughborough. Um, <laughs> so a lot of the Leeds based athletes, yeah, we went down to Loughborough, um, for a couple of weeks. Did they let you um, in? Yeah, they let us in. We had to like ask nicely and bring presents and stuff. And yeah. Um, but, uh, no, they were really good. And we got to stay in the new elite athlete hotel, which I don't know if you've heard about at no. Loughborough. Um, so right next to the track, uh, there's this, well, it's basically like a halls of residence for the freshers but they've bolted a hotel on the end of it that's got like an altitude altitude floor so every oh room on that floor is like equipped to um i guess simulate high altitude so you can go and sleep high and train low um and then they've got like mega chefs in there that cook every meal for you and a lot of um a lot of sports from you know, around the around the country and the world, sort of come in and started using this this location. So um, we got to experience that for a couple of weeks. That was good. That must have been ace. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Like it, it was really good. Yeah, I mean, we, I probably spend far too much time in hotels, but yeah, it was. Um, to be fair, that was a pretty good setup, and um, it was it was quite good for me to be back in Loughborough as well. It's uh, I was down. I lived there for three years when I started triathlon, and um, so I was taking Johnny out on the old rides that I used to do, and you know, because I think he's done like maybe one ride ever in in Loughborough or something. I think that was leading up to London Olympics, and he went out with Stu Hayes when they were getting the um, kit fitting day or something. Yeah. So you know, it, it's quite good to sort of show other triathletes, you know. Uh, what the setup's like in Loughborough, and you know what, um, you know what the rides are like, where the cafe stops are, and whatnot. Um, so it's yeah, it's good, good trip down memory lane. And as well as the altitude hotel, that oh, sorry, the athlete hotel with the altitude. I guess are they doing specific heat testing there? Yeah. So I mean, without going into too much detail because it's all top secret stuff. This, but um, yeah, we were obviously in heat chambers. Um, and you you know you spend a portion of uh, your ride or run for that day 
um, in in the heat, just getting your body really hot and uncomfortable, and then you adapt um, to that, and you hold that you know you hold some of that adaption for uh, a few weeks, and then the idea is that you, you go and and race in a hot climate, and um, you're better equipped for the for the for the conditions. How brutal, um, how brutal is is the heat? Yeah, it's it is pretty grim. It's um, you just you know you're constantly sweating. You sweat so much. I mean, you know, two liters and upwards uh, an hour, oh and um, you, the the guys from Swift actually uh, made it a lot a lot better. So we all had uh, you know Wahoo kickers and Zwift with little iPads, and we were all in like one long line doing like mini races, um, but it more turned into like survival than a race so (laughs) yeah we were all like yeah we'll do a race at uh you know there's one at four o'clock let's all join that and then you join that and you last about three minutes and then you just get too hot and you 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 know you're pushing no power whatsoever and you 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 your core temperature is so hot and it's really hard to sort of bring down once it's up there but then you've just got to kind of grit and bear it for a you know a certain amount of time and um yeah it's not it's not pretty and i think a lot of the the guys and girls were really tired like we you know we saw each other for breakfast every morning and that's the most tired collectively that i've seen a group of athletes on a training camp um, seriously so like completely yeah. different to somewhere like st moritz where you would have been you know ahead of rio for altitude or or whatever or they would have been yeah yeah um and i think I, and I think it just shows just it, it only takes like an hour of like real hot, you know, um, humid environment. I mean, this is super hot, like, you know, well above 30 degrees. But, um, you know, it doesn't take much to um, zap a lot of energy out of you. But I think, you know, you, ha- you have to do that to get the um, acclimatization done properly. You've got to go, you know, super hot. There's no point just going... Uh, you know, you know the the weather we had this weekend in the UK. Uh, still, that's probably still not hot enough. Mm. Um, you'd have to ride with a jacket on and probably you know a base layer and stuff. So it's um, and and other countries will uh, kind of be doing the same thing. A lot more countries will be going to warmer climates uh, to do preparation for Tokyo test event this year. And um, I've seen a you know on social media as a lot of athletes training on turbos in heat chambers and stuff so i think that's going to be a a big factor um you know come the games next year wow and and is there are there many facilities in leeds for that as well because obviously you're based in leeds and um leeds triathlon centers there have they got prep for heat yeah i mean the chamber's just not as big in leeds um so you can't fit as many athletes and i think the head coach ben bright wanted to kind of bring us together as a squad a bit more um whereas if we use it in leads you kind of get your hour slot or whatever and and um you're on your own you're just you and the physiologist um so yeah we can we we can do it here and obviously like johnny's uh didn't want to carry his turbo to you know the lab every day so he that's why he's got his setup at home which is quite a smart idea and you know i know there's i know there's uh, a bunch of athletes who've like converted the shed um you know a real small space that you can get hot really quick with heaters and paint strippers in them and stuff like that um and you know a, a kind of diy lab um it's the glamorous that's all... side of um, yeah. being, elite, <laughs> being an elite yeah. sports person well it's uh, you know and me from a sort of coaching point of view i'm trying to learn about um you know the kona prep and stuff and what people do for that but um you know I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of that going on that we don't really know about, you know, people trying to simulate the elements. I know that a lot of people go to, you know, warm places ahead of Kona and stuff, but for those that don't, I'm sure there's a lot, you know, creating, you know, real hot turbo environments to do the same thing. You know, we've all seen the Lionel Sanders videos and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say in his pain cave, which just looks like a sweat box. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's good because everyone's kind of on the same page at the moment. Everyone just wants to get hot and frustrated. What is your role then at the moment as a as a coach? 
Um, so I'm a performance partner for the British Triathlon Squad, which basically means um, I'm a step up from training partner. Okay. Yeah, because I <laughs> yeah. think when we met in in the Gold Coast, you were you were still training partner. Yeah, yeah. Um, which fundamentally that's um, yeah that's for the Brownlee brothers, but my kind of as leads. Uh, triathlon centre has grown and grown um, I do I take a few sessions for the athletes here and I put on like a drill session each week and cover some coach sessions but then at the same time I'm trying to do 30 hours a week of training so um, yeah like the new PD uh, Mike Cavendish he was sort of really good when he came on board and understood that I kind of couldn't do everything and train at the same time so I'm kind of just at that phase now where I'm I'm 34 and I'm my body's definitely feel it feels more like 54 but um <laughs> I'm, I'm transitioning over to towards that coach and I kind of said that I'll retire from professional triathlon next year after after the games I still think I've got a little bit left in the tank until then <laughs> um but yeah, so I'm, and I'm doing like a bunch of coaching courses and things. Um, so I've done my level three BTF coaching course, um, and I'm on this UK Sport Athletes Coach course, which is really good actually. Yeah, so I've I did, been I did really... see about that, and like the names that um, you know, you've got a load of names of I don't know people like Daniel Fogg, who was um, open water swimmer, like divers, like all sorts of sports. And I guess the idea yeah. is to kind of give you a helping hand to go from athlete to coach yeah yeah it is i mean again it's like everything i seem to do is trying to fast track me i don't know if i just like cutting corners or whatever but um <laughs> but no the course is just to kind of go yeah we identify that you've kind of been through a the uk sport funding system and you you understand kind of elite elite sport to some degree so how can we get you into coaching is quick and there's there's like there's a couple of um guys from taekwondo on there um and they're they're really interesting because they basically like finished in um like retired a couple of years ago and then uh taekwondo are like really need coaches we think you're going to be a good coach even though you've got no coaching qualifications um here's here's jay jones the coach you know um olympic gold medalist and yeah. And, and and then it's hearing their experience of how they've sort of managed that, um, you know, and how they've had to sort of, you know, suddenly go from rolling out of bed, going training to going coaching. And and it is really, really powerful, like having like minded people in the same room and sharing ideas and, uh, you know, the frustrations of the sport and the politics and all that. Um, you know, we all go through kind of the same thing, but um, ultimately, we're all passionate about performance sport, and it's it's great. It really is. Are you missing a bit of the racing now that you're doing more coaching? Um, a, a little bit, but I kind of once I finished up with WTS, I kind of played around with different things. And I thought, right, when when Alistair went long, um, we went and did our debut together at Challenge Grand Canaria, and I kind of enjoyed it a little bit. The seventy point free stuff. I enjoyed the racing, but I don't know the training. Um, I it well, yeah, it's long distance training. It's quite isolated and long, and you know, not as uh, for me, not as like motivating as the sort of the short course training. Um, and so I did a few halves, and um, you know, qualified for worlds last year, and that went you know okay. But I keep getting you know injured uh little niggles here and there and i'm you know trying to do some short course type sessions one week and then long and i just don't think i i've, I've had a great mix mm. over the last couple of years i'll be again i'm probably trying to be doing everything um so i think yeah i think if i look back um it was like the world cup racing that i really enjoyed that was more my level you know i was never gonna crush a world series week in week out but in World Cup race and I could be there or there amongst and I, I really enjoyed that racing and uh, alongside the duathlon stuff that I did um, I think I'll, I'll maybe go back and do that because I, I think I'm allowed to do duathlon as a para guide as well okay. um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do a bit of that but I've tr and I thought for the for the 70.3 stuff I've got to at least try it I've got to 
try and be a better, you know, see what I can get out of myself in this, you know, last couple of years and learn about the sport because it'll just help me with my coaching. Even though I suck at it, I'm just trying everything uh, <laughs> to, to get a little bit better at it. Did you help, or were you training them with Ali as he prepared for Ireland? Yeah, I was training with him, but the, nothing really changed. <laughs> nothing really changed. He didn't really prepare for it. Um, and I think he'll be quite open to that. We, you know, he, one minute he was doing Leeds World Series, right? And then the next thing he was like, mm, I think I might do Ireland. Um, so, yeah, um, we'd, do, we'd, we'd done a bit, um, you know, at the start of the year, because um, obviously he's looking at Nice 70.3. Um, so we jumped back on the TT bikes and done like a couple of weeks of that, but then there was nothing mega specific. And the, in the two weeks that I went over to, um, down to Loughborough, I was training with Johnny. We left Al, uh, back in Leeds and he was training with Gordon Benson and Harry Wiltshire. And I think he went for a couple of long rides with Harry on the TT bike. But other than that, I think, you know, that's his debut, uh, training, uh, taking care of. <laughs> do you think he would have been was he gutted that the swim was cancelled or would he have been quite um, well yeah, Well, we can rib him enough saying that he's not a full Ironman yet <laughs> <Guess he hasn't laughs> so I think if it weren't for us he'd just take it as it is but we're like well no you haven't officially done one yet um, but I, f- I feel for the, pe- the other people I know I shouldn't laugh about that because there's a lot of people who you know spent a lot of money to go and do that race and they didn't they didn't get a full Ironman, but I, th- I think Al would have said, you know, and he has said that surely that it's kind of like the equivalent. It's the hardest bit is the bike and the and the run in terms of the muscle damage and stuff. So um, you're not far off, are you? Um, and especially in those conditions. Oh, anybody who did that, seriously. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I said to him before, or the day before the race, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of guys in that that, can really ride and um uh the irish guy brian mccrystal uh, brian mccrystal i raced him in uh staffordshire last week uh, last year and um he i think he'll say himself he can't really swim and uh but boy he can bike and i was like as soon as that swim got taken out i was like al's gonna have a hard day with this guy and then (laughs) he he did right he was he was leading for what seven and a half hours or something yeah or more yeah um So I, I kind of feel I, I kind of feel for him in a way, but I guess he got the look of not having the swim. So, um, but yeah, I think Al did what he he could, and we kind of followed it. We were training back in Leeds, uh, myself, Johnny, and Gordon. So we we got to a calf stop and watched probably twenty minutes of it. And that whole twenty minutes, all I saw was Al on his uh, on his hoods on his sidebars. Yeah. So we thought he was like really struggling. We're like we haven't seen him gone his aero bars yet. Um, and then we got back home, had lunch, had a bit of a nap, and then oh all my met God, up the race for is a... still going on. Yeah, and we were like, and so we met at four o'clock. A few of us to go for a long run, and we had to cut. You know, we had to wait another twenty minutes for Al to finish. We're like, we've got to see him cross the line on his first Ironman. And so we were just in this car park down the road, just uh, just watching it on our phone, going, "That just looks like a horrible day." It did, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh. So how will he mix now Nice, Tokyo Test Event and Kona? Yeah, good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh you know, obviously everyone's asking the question and and I think Al, you know, he'll 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 tell me so uh, he 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 probably just taking it as it comes at the moment. I think when you're fully fit and you've got no niggles and stuff and you're flying it's it's easy to make decisions, but when you're like, you know, not sure about this, you know, like, is it worth going to Tokyo? Do I really need to go and qualify outright? Do I, do I need to, you know, is Nice that important to me? Um, is Kona that important to me this year? When you don't kind of know, then it's, I think it's hard. And I think Al will do what he, he's always done and just kind of go with the flow a bit and just go with his gut instinct. Um, yeah, I, you know, I still think he should go for Tokyo Olympics. I think there's um, there's a, still a, a chance there, um, and especially with the relay. Um, 
I th- you know, he's a real good relay racer, so there's potentially a medal there as well. Um, and I, th- I think Kona's not a bad idea, even though we all kind of go, right, so the guy did a World Cup sprint distance, then he went and did Leeds, and then he's gone and done an Ironman. Like, I, st- I still kind of think, oh, actually, he's maybe done the right thing. He's, he's kept his options open. Mm. And I think that's important this year because if if he, let's say, he did go to Tokyo uh, test event this year and was not, was completely off the pace and and, and, and said, nah, Tokyo's not for me, at least he's got the option of Kona and like preparing for Kona. So part of Kona preparation, you kind of got to go and see it and before you really go for it. So I guess that's what this year would be about. I don't know. And would you go out with him to Kona? Yeah, I mean, potentially if he if he's really serious about going out there this year and giving it a, like a, an honest effort, then yeah, I think it's it probably worth um, seeing um, from a support point of view. Um, you know, he Al can do without anyone. He could, you know, he wins races without a sport crew or with a sport crew. So I'm not that much of a variable, but I think it'd be a good opportunity for me to to learn about. Um, you know the harsh realities of the course that is Kona, and um, and and yeah, just see it firsthand. Um, but yeah, uh, it, I I I don't know if he knows um, what his what, what his racing plans are between now and and October. Um, but you know he's and this is what I've said to a few people: if this is the first time in Al's career where he's kind of gone, you know what? I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to freestyle it a bit. Then I think he kind of he deserves that for you know for ten years of his coaches and the federation and I guess the triathlon media knowing what he's going to do you know he said he I want to go for a world title this year I want to go for the Olympics I want to go for a Commonwealth so we've always kind of known and you know he said that he's done that for ten years so I think it's about time he he can go you know what I'm just going to go with what I feel like and I'm not going to put myself under any pressure yeah yeah okay, it must be blooming refreshing for him yeah yeah and that's that's how you know that's how i kind of you know if i was in his position i'll be like you know just take some pressure off yourself don't say i'm going to do this this and this yeah you know say you know that's what i did for the last 10 years i'm going to let you all um chat about it doesn't matter. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it really doesn't matter it's not your the, yeah. you that doing it yeah, yeah. <laughs> What what about the um the World Triathlon series this year, especially on the men's side? Like, has it surprised you just how kind of open it's been and how many different names are up there? Yeah, it's it's kinda the men's and the women's has totally changed, eh? Yeah. Um it's totally flipped on its head. I you know, I I, I just kinda look at the stats and the results and follow, you know, some of the athletes, but um I not racing it you don't kind of see why it's like the way it is but i just kind of think my this i mean is my opinion on it but um take it with a pinch of salt i just think no one's got that much better um from where it has been for like you know the last the last three olympic cycles i just think there's more people at the level now i i don't think anyone's doing maybe vincent louis i think he's he's kind of special because he swims bikes and runs so well but other than him, I just think there's a lot more people who are coming off the bike at that, you know, that level, and they're starting to ride a bit better and stuff like that. But I don't think it's, I don't think that, um, you know, the ripping round courses a lot quicker than they used to do, or running off the bike much quicker. Um, I just think with the men, there's just like, you know, just so many guys. Back in the day, there might have been, you get to a World Series race, there might have been five guys that you'd say, right out of those five three of them are podium now i think it's like 10 mm. um so and, and which is great for the sport because we get different podiums every week and you know you 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 know the guys that we'd call the greats um get put under the cosh a lot more and it makes for more, a lot more exciting racing yeah definitely and then the likes of georgia taylor brown and and jess learmonth they're flying this season aren't they yeah, they're they're in a really good place those two, um, and they do quite a bit of training together as well, which which I think helps. And that you know that whole training environment which we talk about in Leeds is you know it's really important. You've got to get that nailed down. I think wherever you are in the world, 
Um, so whether it's, you know, here in Leeds or, you know, like the Joel Filiol squad, that does so well because they've got a, you know, a, a good environment there um, where the athletes can train alongside each other and, you know, not get overly competitive and stressed by each other and, and instead flourish. Um, but yeah, like seeing Montreal at the weekend, uh, yeah, Georgia and Jess particularly yeah, are in a really good place. Um, and they're just going to battle it out with Katie Zafir as it looks like for the rest of the season. Tell me about um, Yonder as well. Yonder is um, it's like a, a wetsuit triathlon suit um, brand, isn't it? But you got involved from the very outset, didn't you? Yeah, we maybe first started thinking about it uh, just after 2012, 2013 or something. Did you, um, was it your idea or was it was it Angus? Um, it was Angus. So Angus is 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 like the CEO of the company, and um, where the, we were the same like running club back then. It's kind of called like a it's well it's, it's got a triathlon club now. It's Home for Harriers, but um, it didn't really have a triathlon section then. But he was into triathlon, and and uh, obviously I just started doing it. And um, he he was he came from like a material science background, and you know really knew different fabrics that uh, you know suited different sports and uh and and the industry as well um and he kind of said oh, i want to i think there's something i can do in triathlon but i don't know what so we started off with um a tri suit and then eventually got into wetsuits and um yeah and then here the company is now and it's uh you know people are asking us who are lining up on world series starts uh if they can wear our suit and stuff and so it's yeah it's it's been amazing, really. Um, it's been really good. And how, how much of that time, how much of your time does that take up? Uh, not as much as it did to begin with. Um, so Angus went kind of full-time with it um, a couple of years ago. And then because I was still racing and I'd committed to British Triathlon um, until sort of 2020, um, Yonder couldn't really wait for me. So I kind of took a bit more of a backseat with the company and, and then... Angus has steamed ahead with it um, and I mean he's, he's always kind of wanted to you know keep it a fairly small business he don't want to make Yonder into a, a massive superpower in the wetsuits because I don't think he he kind of wants that stress and that you know that life he kind of just likes producing high quality wetsuits that people really like swimming in um, and you know that and, and he gets a lot from that rather than you know the zeros on the bottom of the balance sheet um and 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 so i still sort of test suits out and obviously do a bit of self-promotion and things like that and go to the occasional event um but yeah i think it's something more that i'll come back and revisit you know post 2020 and get my hands dirty again I was gonna. I was gonna say, what what are the plans then post 2020? Would you would you like to set up your own training squad? Um, yeah, well, yeah, um, I think I would. Yeah, in a short answer, I would. Um, uh, I'd like to kind of. I think my ideal job would be, yeah, um, at least half of my time spent in performance sport. Um, so working alongside the, you know, the federation. Um, with athletes that are you know racing uh on the you know on the wts circuit or you know the 70.3 circuit and then maybe the rest of my time um spent doing a bit of you know age group coaching or um and and dabbling with bits with yonder as well i think i think that's what my my ideal setup would be but i think yeah um performance sports what i'm really passionate about but then there's not an awful lot of money and jobs available in performance sport, if you get me. Um, so I've just got to see what you know opportunities there are there there is um, n- next year. So um, yeah, but I'm just kind of in the moment. I'm just kind of arm myself with enough coaching qualifications and and and, and knowledge as I can uh, before that. Love it. Mark, I, I want to ask one more question, um, and I'm gonna <laughs> and I'm gonna leave you to your afternoon. The the final question is, um, Lucy, your girlfriend, Lucy Hall, who competed at the 2012 uh, Olympics, she has now has she now switched then to sort of longer distance? Yeah, she um she was oh she came off um, lottery funded, so 
off the world class program last year, and that sometimes that's quite a good indication of where you're at with things. Um, you know, if you're not having the results in World Series that you like, then then you might want to consider something else. And she's always been like, you know, everyone's kind of said it. You'll crush long distance when you go to it. But, you know, she's always been terrified by the prospect of it because she kind of, all she's known since she was, you know, 12 years old is, you know, sprint race, sprint or Olympic dis- distance racing. Um, so, yeah, she she thought this is the year to at least have a go and test the water. So I think a plan was to do, you know, maybe like three or four 70.3s and then mix that up with, you know, three or four Olympic distance races. Um but then, unfortunately, at the start of the year, she got um, a plantar fasciitis problem. So um, I'm sure a lot of your listeners have had um, a plantar fasciitis problem at, at some yeah. point. If not, they'll have had an Achilles problem. I think, apparently, it's one or the other. If you don't get plantar problem, you get Achilles and vice versa. Um, I've had a lot of Achilles problems, no plantar. But, yeah. Um, and, and it's just been a, a long road to recovery. You know, it's been six months nearly. Um, and so she's only just started to do a, a couple of run sessions, and so she did um, escape to Alcatraz a few weeks ago, because um, that was kind of like a bit of a bucket list race. Yeah. And she's done a few of the escape series races, so like London and Beijing and stuff. So she thought she'd start uh, with that one and then do this race in Finland at the weekend. Love it. So we will we will keep on watching then, keep on watching um, with interest and see how it goes. We will follow you as well, Mark. There's loads going on. It's very exciting. Yeah, there's a lot going on. And there is a lot um, going on. You sound sort of kind of as busy as me, which means that life's good. Yeah, I think it's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Have a nice day. And um, yeah, I'll keep listening to more podcasts. All right, superb stuff there. Right, everybody, that brings us just about to the end of this week's show. Next week, we'll be back to our normal recording pattern where we'll be talking over the results of Ironman UK. I'll be trying to track down um, people who've done well at that event between now and then. So hopefully we're going to have some interviews from people who've done well at Ironman UK. Um, Apologies for the interruption to the usual um, the usual podcast schedule here, unavoidable due to travel. But hopefully you've all had great races. If you've raced at Ironman UK this weekend, I hope it's gone really well for you. And we look forward to hearing about it. Drop us a line on Facebook or on Twitter to tell us how your race went. Remember, you can join our free Oxygen Addict Triathlon Community Facebook group. Love to hear about how your race has gone over in there. So listen, until next week, just a shout out to sponsors, precisionhydration.com and foodcell.co.uk. And yeah, until next week, everybody have a great, safe training and racing week. We'll see you again. I'm coach Rob Wilby. Next week, I'll be joined again by Helen Murray and we'll speak to you again next week. Thanks, everyone. See ya.